Welcome to the second lecture in Unit 4. It's called Isn't It Exciting? It says, Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And that is a famous quote by Dr. Carl Sagan. So, the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the learning goals. The learning goals for this particular presentation are that students will be able to understand the behavior of light as both a wave and a particle. That you be familiar with the various divisions of the electromagnetic spectrum and that you'll be able to use the formula shown below. So first, what we already know. We already know that electrons in an atom can move up and down in energy levels. We talked about that in the first lecture. We said that when an atom absorbs energy, it bumps the electron up, and that whenever an atom loses energy, it bumps the electron down. Now, absorption moves electrons up in a level, and emission moves them down. So what we learned in the lab, we learned that different frequencies of radiation can move electrons up different levels. The higher the frequency, the more, uh, the more electron, or excuse me, the higher it can move the electrons up, and that there are divisions of the electromagnetic spectrum, that there's some sort of red, green, blue, ultraviolet, infrared sort of divisions of what we call light. Now light is a wave. This is a famous experiment that was done by Young that actually provided the first evidence that light was a wave. People had thought that light was a wave for a long time, but this was the first actual evidence. Basically what he did is he had two light sources. Think about it as two flashlights. And when you shine a flashlight on the wall, there's a bright spot in the middle, and then it fades as you go this way. So it fades to black. And it fades to black. Now the assumption is that if you had two light sources, two flashlights, then you could take them, you could shine them together, and you just have a bigger region of bright, okay, so that this would, this would be a larger region, but it would still fade to black. And that's what you see if you use a regular flashlight. But if you use a flashlight that's the exact same source and timed just right, this is the pattern that you get. You do get this bright spot in the middle, but then you get these black spots, and then it fades out. Okay, about this more in physics. But if you have waves that go like this, when you add those two waves together, they cancel out to zero. When there is no light, that's the black spot or the destructive interference that you have there. Next, we say that light is a particle. Light is a particle. So there is evidence that light is a particle as well. Uh, and that's what we call the photoelectric effect. And this is the first evidence that light's a particle. So what we did is we set up a light source and we, sh we shone, shined on a photoemissive surface. So what this means is when you shine light on it, electrons can move out. Now, this was actually done before the invention of a light bulb, but think about this as a light bulb. Okay. If you were to take this thing and shine different colors of light on it, if you were to shine red light on it, nothing would happen. And that's kind of strange because if you think of light as a wave, you would think these waves would just add up and add up and add up until electrons were emitted. And that's what people thought would happen, but it's not what happened. So instead, they looked at it with other colors of light, violet. Whenever you shine violet on it, all of a sudden these electrons started jumping off and they would make the light bulb light up. Okay. So the question is this, why will it works for violet light but not for red light. In addition it works for blue, it works for green, but it doesn't work for orange or yellow. And the reason why is actually it was put forth by Albert Einstein said that you have to think of this light as a particle. Okay? Think of it like pool balls. I've got an electron right here and I've got this particle. If I hit it fast enough this ball will start to move. Think about playing pool. But if I hit this thing and it barely touches this, it's not going to be enough to knock off the electron on the other side. So because of that, he said that this didn't have sufficient energy when it was red to knock something off. So it gave evidence that light's a particle. Now, we actually now know that it exhibits what we call wave-particle duality. Okay, you can think of light as both a wave and a particle depending on the situation. Now, you can set up experiments to promote the wave behavior. You can set up experiments to promote the particle behavior. So, we have electromagnetic radiation. We talked about this briefly in the first presentation about how we call it light, but it's really not light. There's a lot more than light. If you were to look at this, this represents the electromagnetic spectrum. This right here is the part that you can see. 
Now the part that you can see is an incredibly small part of the whole electromagnetic spectrum, starting with radio waves and working all the way up through gamma rays. Now the key is this, even though we call it the speed of light, all electromagnetic radiation will travel at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Okay, so there is no difference between how fast a radio wave goes, how fast a light wave goes, how fast an infrared wave goes, how fast an ultraviolet. They all, they all travel at 3 times 10 to the 8th. So we're going to walk through the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. The first one you see here is the radio wave. Now the radio wave is the lowest of all the energies. It's the lowest of all the frequencies, and it's the highest of all the wavelengths. Now by wavelength, what we mean is how big a wave is from here to here. Okay, so they're the longest ones. Now radio waves have such a low energy that they generally don't interact with the electron. Instead, they can be used to excite the nucleus. And what you see here is an example of what we call nuclear magnetic resonance using radio waves. Now you don't have to know about that, but just know that we can find out information by exciting a nucleus with radio waves. Next we have microwaves. Microwaves have a slightly higher energy than a radio wave. This slightly higher frequency and a slightly smaller wavelength. So it's it's and a lot of people say, well, how do I know when it goes from radio to wavelength? Or excuse me, radio to microwave. It's a gradual transition. There's no once you get past this, you're no longer radio, you're micro. It's a transition between the two. Okay? So now you can actually use microwave radiation to observe how molecules rotate. So if I have some sort of molecule that looks like this, um, let's see, draw it looks like this how this thing rotates in space can tell me a little bit about how they're connected and it actually can be used to look at different what are called isomers. Okay, now we have infrared radiation. Infrared radiation you can think of as heat. Okay, it's heat that is transmitted. It's not like you touch it and it's hot, but if you can take it and say, um, I can put my hand away from it, not directly above it, and heat is still transferred, that's infrared radiation. Now, Infrared radiation, you see it a lot with infrared lamps if you've ever worked at a restaurant or gone to a restaurant. Now, if you were to look right here, infrared has slightly higher energy, slightly higher frequency, slightly smaller wavelength, so you start to see a pattern. When we started at radio, it was the lowest energy, lowest frequency, and we're moving this way. Now, infrared radiation can actually be used to vibrate the bonds between atoms. So whenever you have an atom be or a bond between two atoms, a lot of us say, this is the distance of the bond but it will vibrate back and forth so it'll get bigger and it'll get smaller and we can actually use that to determine what this bond is or what what is on either side of this bond okay next we have visible light visible light is the one that you should be most familiar with it's in the middle of the spectrum it's got medium frequency medium energy medium wavelength um, and it can be used to excite electrons okay and this kind of puts it in perspective it shows you that the red blue green all that stuff that we see is actually a very 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 small part of the electromagnetic spectrum ultraviolet ultraviolet has a higher frequency a higher energy and a higher wave or excuse me a lower wavelength and once again it can be used to excite electrons now ultraviolet radiation can actually be used to excite electrons to a higher level than traditional light because it has a higher energy X-rays have an even higher frequency, have an even higher energy, and have an even lower wavelength. Because the wavelength is so small, it starts to be to the point where it will penetrate the skin. Okay, So because of that, we can actually use X-rays to produce images of uh, bones inside your body. Now, X-rays in science are used generally to ionize an atom. Whenever you have an atom and it has this electron, um, ra oh, excuse me, not radio, visible light and UV light will take it up to higher levels. X-rays have such high energy that it will actually take this electron and give it so much energy that it no longer belongs to the atom. It'll just leave and go off on its own. It'll be a free electron at that point. So that's what X-rays can do. Now gamma rays are the highest in frequency, the highest in energy, the lowest in wavelength, and gamma rays are specifically used in science for what are called removing the inner electrons. Generally speaking, all of the other radiations work on what are called the valence electrons. Okay, Those are the electrons that are on the outside layer. So when I use visible light or UV light or something like that, it's working on this outside electron. Gamma rays have so much um, energy 
that they can actually hit this inner electron and knock this inner electron all the way out of the atom. Well, when that happens, you start to see electrons moving in. You get kind of a cascade effect that can give you a lot of information. Okay, the developing A1, it says develop an acronym to help you remember the order of frequency, wavelength, or energy. Now, the one that I like to use is red, Martians, invade, Venus, using X-ray, guns. Red Martians invade Venus using X-ray guns or radio, micro, infrared, visible, UV, X, and gamma. Proficient. It says a, a cell phone frequency is very similar to the frequency that causes water to heat up in a microwave. Should you be concerned about placing a cell phone close to your head and you need to justify with the clear method? Now, a lot of people say yes. All of a sudden, what happens if I microwave the water in my brain? Well, remember, um, the first radiation that is small enough to actually penetrate the skin is x-rays. Okay, So microwaves, even though they can be used to heat up water, are not capable of penetrating the skin. So if I were to answer this, um, should I be concerned? No. That's my answer. That's my conclusion. I'm not concerned. No, I'm not concerned. The evidence that I have to support that is that the microwave, or that the microwaves are outside the skin. Okay, The evidence has to come from the question itself. The reasoning is I have to apply scientific knowledge to make the evidence fit my answer. And the reasoning that I have in this particular case is microwaves cannot penetrate skin. We have a mastery level question. It says the sun has an average coronal temperature that can reach 3 million Kelvin while uh, emitting primarily visible radiation. It says speculate on the energy level, transition type, and, and type of radiation uh, produced by a theoretical star with a coronal temperature of 100 million Kelvin. Justify your answer using the clear method. Now this seems like it's incredibly complicated. But if you look at our spectrum, we have radio, micro, infrared, visible, UV, X, and gamma. That's the Greek letter for gamma. Now, if I produce primarily visible light when I have 300 million Kelvin, you should look at it and say, if I provide it with more energy, is it going to move towards radio or is it going to move towards gamma? And if you said towards gamma, you would be correct. So the clear method, I would say, it would produce, I would say, mostly UV radiation. If you said X or gamma, that's fine. Okay, it would produce mostly UV radiation. The evidence that I have to support that statement is that the temperature is 33 times higher. Okay, Or you could say the temperature jumps from 3 million to 100 million. Now the reasoning that I have is the more energy that is that it, that's an atom is given, the more or the higher the transition, the higher the frequency. This is the equation that you can be used to um, show the relationship between frequency and wavelength for all electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so you see the equation C equals lambda F, and this was re referenced briefly in a mastery example in the previous, uh, previous video. But you see C equals lambda F. C represents the speed of light. It is called the speed of light, but it is really the speed of all electromagnetic radiation. And it's given a value, it's a constant value, in fact that's why it's called C, of 3 times 10 to the 8th. It's measured in meters per second because it's a speed and we, we deal with the metric system, so it's like miles per hour, you get meters per second. Um, this, this look right here, this look, looks like an upside down Y, is the Greek letter lambda. Now, the Greek letter lambda refers to the wavelength of a particular uh, wave, and it represents a complete wavelength. So if you had a, a wave like this, it represents the distance of one complete wave. This represents a complete wave because it has a top and a bottom. So that would represent the wavelength, the distance between those two identical points. Or you can think of it as from top to top. That would represent one wavelength. If you look, those two distances are the same. So that's wavelength. Now frequency represents the number of waves that pass a certain point every second. Now we measure frequency in the, in the unit of the hertz. And hertz, because people get confused on how the units match up, they say how can meters times hertz equal meters per second? A hertz is really one over second. Okay? It's the number of waves per second. 
but we represent it as hertz. So that's how the units match up. So let's look at some examples. The first one says the sun emits all different forms of EM radiation. Gamma through radio, the sun emits. Now, which segment of the EM spectrum will reach Earth first? Now, I tend to ask the questions like this or in a little bit different form, but really basically what this, say, this is saying is what is the fastest form of EM radiation? What is fastest? And I will have people tell me this all the time. They'll say light. Now, that's not the answer because we've already said all electromagnetic radiation travels at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So the answer is none of them or all of them, depending on how you put it. None of them or all of them because they all reach at the same time, so none of them will get there first. Depends on how you want to answer it. And the next one says, what is the frequency and energy of red light? So this one is kind of a two-step question. We're going to... Um, so we say the frequency of red light is the first one we're going to tackle. Now, we know that the speed of light is a constant. It's C equals lambda F. And we know that we can say this right in here represents a lambda. Now, you should know by now that nanometers means times 10 to the minus 9th. So you can write this as 750 times 10 to the minus 9th. Now, that's not great scientific notation. It should actually be 7.5 times 10 to the minus 7th because I had to move the decimal over 2. But you should be able to do that. And I want to solve for the frequency. Now, it doesn't actually tell me what the C value is, but I know that the C is a constant. It's the speed of light. So I can say 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Okay. So now I can say 3 times 10 to the 8th equals lambda, which is my 7.5 times 10 to the minus 7th, and then F. I would need to solve for F by dividing both sides by 7.5 times 10 to the minus 7th. And when I do that, you would put it in your calculator and you would get a number of 4 times 10 to the 14th. Whoops. Let's write that a little more clear. 4 times 10 to the 14th. Now, as an extension, I want you to be able to turn that into energy. Because on the previous video, we said once you have the frequency, you should be able to turn, take, turn around and take that and turn it into energy using the equation E equals HF. So I want you to be able to do that on your own. The last one we have, it says an X-ray has an energy of 3.8 times 10 to the minus 14 joules and 125 photon dose. Regardless of the medium, X-rays travel the x-ray travels in, it maintains a constant frequency. It says x-rays can travel at 1 times 10 to the 8th meters in, in soft tissue. What is the difference in wavelength of an x-ray in a tissue and an x-ray in a soft vacuum, or excuse me, in a vacuum? So the question is, this is kind of a difficult question in the sense that we need to look at this thing and we need to be able to answer basically two questions. I want to know what the wavelength is in a vacuum, and I want to know what the wavelength is in the soft tissue. So this can be kind of tricky. So how are we going to do this? Well, first thing we want to do is we want to write our given. I know that the x-ray has an energy of 3.8 times 10 to the minus 14th. Okay, and that's the energy in 125 photon dose. So the very first thing I need to do is I need to be able to identify the frequency of this particular object. So I can use the equation E equals HF. But remember, I can't do E equals HF because it's a multiple photons. So I actually need to put the N there as well. So I would say E equals NHF or 3.8 times 10 to the minus 14th equals 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th times 125 F. So this should be Right there, I ran out of room. So now, in order to solve this for F, I would need to divide both sides by 6.626 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th times 125. When I do that, that'll cancel, that'll cancel, and I'll be left with my frequency. The frequency, whenever you calculate it out, should be about 4.59 times 10 to the 17th. And that's in hertz. Once you know that, you can go back to the problem and say, okay, it says that it maintains a constant frequency regardless of what it travels in. Okay, so I can do the calculation C equals lambda F. When I do that, I get 3 times 10 to the 8th equals wavelength 4.59 times 10 to the 17th. 
And what that allows me to do, I can divide both sides by 4.59 times 10 to the 17th. And when I do that, I get my wavelength, which is about 6.53 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. Now, I need to do another wavelength calculation. The problem with this other wavelength calculation is that I can't use the speed of light anymore because x-rays don't travel at the speed of quote-unquote light whenever it's traveling through another object. It actually slows down a bit. It slows down to 1 times 10 to the 8th. So for the second calculation, I actually need to write 1 times 10 to the 8th. And right now people are saying, but you told me that that was a constant, that it was the speed of light. It is a constant whenever it's traveling in a vacuum. Whenever light starts to travel through something else, like a diamond or water, it actually slows down. But the procedure is the exact same. Divide by 4.59 times 10 to the 17th. And if you notice, it's the exact same procedure, it's the exact same divided by, it's just a different numerator on the left to begin with. So when I do that, I get 2.18 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. And if you look, you have your two answers. But that's not exactly what it's asking for. And you're looking at me going, whoa, this is a ton. You're right. This is trying to pull all of the information from two videos together. It says, what is the difference in wavelengths? Difference of plot means, what is the difference when you subtract between the two? When you subtract these two, the change or the difference in wavelength is 4. Point, excuse me, I messed that up. 4.35 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. That is your final answer.